I'm Mike Simmons. I'm founder and the president of Astronomers Without Borders. And uh, I was invited here to talk about some of the things that we do. And, you know, it's, uh, Mila mentioned it, that it's about popularizing astronomy. It's many things. I started Astronomers Without Borders mainly to connect people from different countries. We're all doing the same things in different parts of the world. We're all traveling through space. We're seeing the same stars, the same sky. And we're just on different parts of this planet. And when we connect with each other through our <coughs> passion for astronomy, we have that sense that we are um, together on this spaceship called Earth. and you know, we're one people and we share that. And astronomy is the only thing really that does that. Uh, I'm going to show some pictures here now and it's going to be a familiar slide to everybody, but it's just one of a series that I have. In okay. five years ago, we had 100 hours of astronomy in the International Year of Astronomy. I still show these slides because we had hundreds of thousands, maybe a million people take part in this global star party around the world. And yeah. it really was the most amazing demonstration of what it is astronomy can do to bring people together. This, of course, is in India, but when we look at other places, not so far away, Bangladesh here, they really got into it. They used our yeah. uh, brandy and made their own t-shirts and so on. Um, in Iran, we had people participating there. In uh, northern Iraq, this is a telescope I actually took over there uh, before that in Kurdistan. Uh, in Baghdad even, you know, this is a very bad time in the war there and and uh, crowds were a uh, target for terrorists and there were 500 people, they said we're going to do it anyway and they and they did. I'm not, I don't even remember which country this is, but you can see that the uh, teacher has the uh, a coat on there that is uh, covered with stars and here we are in Nepal and you know look at this after a while you realize these all look like the same pictures but with different people who happen to be in different places this is a telescope like the one in Iraq this one is in the in uh, either Bolivia or Peru I think Bolivia <coughs> And a picture like this could be from any place. This is a uh, solar image being viewed by a young boy in Romania. So <clears throat> these are the things that we see that we recognize. This is really the same thing. We, we all have music, but it's different music. But the, the stars are the same. And so we use that. And even when we look up, these uh, photography like this, I think this is not too much different. A uh, latitude from uh, New Delhi, maybe maybe for a little bit more south. Yeah. This happens to be in California where, where I live. This is Yosemite Valley. But if okay. you took this picture in, in the middle of India, it, you'd have different foreground, but the sky would look yeah. exactly the same. And uh, we see the Milky Way. Uh, this is how you might see it, maybe down in Sri Lanka or something, but this is from the top of Mauna Kea. And uh, as you can see from the telescopes there, looking to the south. But when we go to the south of, of that, here is uh, in, well into the southern hemisphere to Guazu Falls in uh, Brazil, uh, on the boundary between Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina. And you see the large Magellanic clouds there, which of course are southern. So, and the moon, let's take the moon. You know, we see that rising and setting. But every time we look at it, we know other people yeah. somewhere else around the world, east and west, are looking at it also. But they're seeing it at a different height. Here over the Parthenon in Athens, Greece, here in central Iran, in Yazd, the moon rising uh, over the skyline of Boston in eastern U.S. and rising over the Taj Mahal. So we see it every place and at that same time, you know, there are times when we could probably see the moon at the same time, me in California and, and you in New Delhi. So well, here are some of the things we do, and these are just examples of some things. This is a blog that we have. Every member gets to post things. Now this blog is inactive now. We're going through a major change in the website, but it's going to be really much better, all designed with special tools to allow everyone to share what it is they're doing so that you can see, if you're a member, even a free member, uh, what other people are doing, the clubs can see what other clubs are doing. This is uh, school astronomy in Morocco. This is the kind of thing that space does in India quite a bit. 
In yeah. this case, though, they're doing the same thing in Morocco, and they're sharing that and showing some of the pictures of the students there. So this is perhaps a very familiar type of pictures for those of you in space in, in India, but the people are different. But what we're doing with astronomy is precisely the same thing. We do remote observing together. Now, this is an older program. <coughs> we had uh, one event in the south and one event in the north using remotely operated telescopes. Thousands of people join in. So here we're having a star party actually together because we can have 10,000, 20,000. This same facility on the left, the virtual telescope, had 400,000 uh, visitors watching yeah. For the uh, the comet near approach to uh, the sighting comet sighting springs close approach to Mars, and so people have a chat box and they type in there and they talk to each other and nobody even knows where they are. They're just all on Earth until somebody puts in you know where are you from and then everybody types in their countries. So and we have hangouts like this. It's an example that uh, picture there is they're sharing from Vietnam. Uh, a connection with uh, Philippines, I believe. So all this is designed to bring people together. Now here's a different kind of thing. We were asked by uh, Carolyn Porco, who runs the imaging lab for the Cassini spacecraft, to uh, help with the public outreach uh, for the the uh, what she called the Day the Earth Smiled at JPL. It was a wave at, at Saturn when Earth was being imaged from behind Saturn, so the, the sun was blocked, and probably everybody remembers this, uh, <coughs> and uh, last year. And uh, so this is what the picture of Earth was supposed to look like. Saturn darkened, sun and eclipse behind it, and Earth down on the lower right. And here's Carolyn here with, the, uh, with some of the others of her team in Colorado and the U.S. And what we were expecting this to look but, like, but it hadn't been taken yet. And so we asked everybody to join in observing Saturn together and share their pictures with us. And this is, um, I believe this is in uh, Karachi, Pakistan, <coughs> here in California, uh, sidewalk astronomer. Uh, very big star party uh, in Argentina. And everybody wanted to see this. Well, here, these were some of our students at a uh, summer program we do at Mount Wilson Observatory that I helped to teach. And we had the 60-inch telescope that night, maybe one of the bigger ones wow. that uh, was pointed at Saturn at exactly the time the picture was being taken. And these are students from, uh, I think, the bottom three are from the US. Uh, Latin America, I don't remember which country. And then at the top is a student from uh, Sri Lanka. A very excited Caltech uh, student at, at Caltech in Pasadena, pointing to where Saturn is, posing here with Saturn, <coughs> posing with Saturn in the background. The idea was to take these portraits. This is, uh, I, I think it's Mexico, but it could have been Arizona. This one is Mexico, Guadalajara. Uh, this is the, the, these are employees at Celestron. Uh, our marketing manager here and uh, some of the others here who, who uh, and they're uh, big supporters of, uh, of Astronomers Without Borders too. So again, taking pictures in New Zealand with Saturn in Iran uh, in, a, in the desert of, uh, I believe, Morocco, someplace in North, North Africa. And uh, even at a wedding, their picture was being taken by the Cassini spacecraft during their wedding. It was at the same time. It happened to be an astronomer friend, Jay Pasikoff, solar astronomer. And I saw him. He was on the way to the wedding. This is his nephew. So he had them pose with the picture there so that we have even a wedding picture. Because when Cassini took that spacecraft, all of us were in it, including them. And activities here in... Uh, uh, South America or Central America, I don't remember the country, in Ghana, in Africa. And these pictures were all collected up and turned into a mosaic of, uh, of, of Saturn with the spacecraft down here and with the Earth down here. So, And this is something we do regularly too, uh, something we learned from India, I think, because it's not as common here. But we, we have certificates of participation for people that organize and take part and so on. So even if it's thousands of people, we have event registration for these different things, and people get a chance to download and yeah. 
you know, different souvenirs that we might have. And here is actually the image. Well, Earth is down here. We can't, I can't even see it there. But if we zoom in, here we are. Earth looks like a tiny little bit there is the moon right next to it. But when we zoom in, we can see Earth and the moon there. Yeah, we can see the moon also. Yeah, yeah, which is an amazing thing. So <clears throat> here's something else, and I know this has done some in India. I don't know if UCB or others in space are involved in this. This looks like a regular star party, somebody yeah. craning their neck to look up through binoculars. But when you look at the person after it, you realize she's, she's blind. She's sight disabled, and uh, she walks with a cane. But she, it, a lot of people who are legally blind can see just a little bit, and they might not be able to see who you are or anything like that, but they can see things that are very high contrast in the telescope. So this is something, uh, many different types of things for the sight disabled, like this, for example. This is a planetarium program. This is available. The, this is done by a uh, university in Spain. <clears throat> and this is available for people to get, along with a number of other uh, things that uh, are designed for uh, sight disabled. So this is a great kit uh, called um, the Sky in Your Hands. Yes. And uh, and so this is, uh, and I think the kit, I think the sky in your hands is the planetarium show. The whole kit is called uh, Touch the Universe. And uh, so this is, they, they can actually feel the dome and listen to the narration. We do a lot of things with astro arts, and this has really been very big. And you know, I know that we had some winners in the astro poetry contest this last year in Global Astronomy Month in April. Uh, but there are other crafts, um, original music uh, composed and performed by the composer you see in the lower left there uh, with uh, uh, some incredible images behind him. So it's a special thing, the uh, uh, concert, the cosmic concert that he does every year, uh, different astro artists. And this uh, brings people from all over the world and many different things. Uh, astro poetry is very big in uh, Romania, for example. We see some of the poetry right there in the picture. So there are many things that go on there that interest people in different ways. Some of us want to look through telescopes. Some of us are interested in the idea of astronomy, the philosophy and teaching in public outreach, and here in using it to help people in uh, disadvantaged countries. So this is Chuck Reilly, who with his wife Susan travels to Tanzania. They went there as retired ministers, a part of the, part of a Lutheran church uh, mission, but he's an amateur astronomer. He brought a telescope and he realized they're fascinated by it and they have very few resources. They yeah. don't have telescopes like this. He brought this along. But you know, this was this is equivalent to the poorest areas you'd find in uh, India. With dirt floors, no, no uh, uh, maybe a blackboard, no posters. Nothing. And the most important thing is the teachers aren't trained in astronomy. And they don't even have training, basic training a lot of times in, uh, in sciences. So they have the laboratory. This is a small telescope that we actually uh, are selling for fundraising uh, thanks to sponsorship by Celestron. And it's now over there where the teachers have been trained. Uh, there's a large telescope going over there. We had an Indiegogo campaign to raise money to send this there and build a center for science. And they're actually changing the way that, that uh, science is taught. <clears throat> they're still using something that you'll be very familiar with in many areas, I think, of India. The, the old 19th century British system, which is the teacher yeah. talks and the students listen and they take notes and that's it. No questions of the students. They don't ask. The, the students would never think of asking a question of the teachers or even challenging them. But the teachers are being taught this. Teach astronomy through hands-on with different kinds of optics, with telescopes. They're having fun doing it and they see the value. So this is this using astronomy to introduce STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We, it touches on all of them. It's, it's, you know, universal. I mean, there isn't anything that, that you can't touch on with astronomy. So using that as a way to introduce science, it's going to change the way science is taught in Tanzania. And generations from now, they should have their own science, scientists and engineers if this is really successful. We raised money with this, but it did a lot of good as well. When the uh, total eclipse of the sun went across Africa last year, we... We sell these solar, uh, solar 
uh, glasses for, for viewing, but we lowered it in the bottom price and asked people to buy them for us to send to Africa. And yeah. we sent tens of thousands of them over to Africa into the eclipse path here uh, to many of the countries here, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Gabon, um, but also other countries where they had the partial eclipse in, in uh, well, Tanzania for one and uh, let's see some of the others there uh, Nigeria we had a lot of them over there and Ghana and so um, this did a lot of good and it, it's through sharing because we have to have the contents, contacts over there that we know that can get to the schools it, it's the kind of thing we could do with space in India if there was something like an eclipse and we had something like this. But you have to know the people there. They end up out on the street being sold to people, you know. So, so that's a, a way in which we share and we bring our resources and their networks together, and boom, we have something that's fantastic and allows. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, experience listening to you. But uh, we have told both the organizations so. Uh, Astronomers Without Border is such a wonderful concept, but uh, let me just tell the viewers that uh, you are the actually the founder and the president of Astronomers Without Border, and uh, your journey as an astronomer it's quite long. You uh, joined in early 70s the LA Astronomical Society, and you served as a president I think for two two times there and. Then you were on the board of directors for uh, quite a long time, and then you found uh, something what you call the Mount Wilson Observatory Association. Mm -hmm. It's a support organization dedicated to the improving the experience of visitors to the observatory. Normally, what happens to an observatory is that people go there and uh, see the telescope, but they usually don't get to know about the the happenings over there or the whole observatory. So it's a kind of a very uh, good support organization you made just to make their experience more richful so that the, when they go back home they, they learn more about the the stuff about the observatory rather than just being a observatory with a telescope. And exactly. during the International Year of Astronomy, uh, it was your effort to organize that one of the cornerstone project called 100 Hours of Astronomy and I remember uh, during that 100 hours, uh, we were continuously working with the kids and the masses, continuous continuation of astronomy for 100 hours without, uh, I mean, winking of an eye. And it was the largest outreach effort uh, during that International Era of Astronomy. And then uh, let me just uh, tell viewers something about, uh, about the prizes or about the awards you got. Uh, there's a minor planet named after you, it's Planet Simmons, if I'm not uh, wrong. And it was, uh, I mean, the name was given in honor of you, I think, in 2003 for uh, your uh, efforts in the varied outreach activities in astronomy. And uh, in 2005, you received an award, uh, Clifford W. Holmes Award, for the major contribution to popularizing astronomy. And in 2009, Mike received the prestigious a G. Bruce Blair Award uh, for the given by the Western Amateur Astronomers for the once again, as we know, contribution to the amateur astronomy. And uh, when you founded the Astronomer Without Border in 2006, since then uh, it has taken uh, leaps and bounds in organizing activities throughout the globe, and space also has been part of this for. Uh, since its inception and uh, I think the, you got the entries in the astro poetry and things like that from the kids who were like in their primary or the middle classes. So that was a, a really a, a thing which actually defines this word that astronomers without water, that astronomy does not need, uh, need borders at all. So when it's uh, once again, it's a privilege to have you here in a hangout. Mila, uh, uh, I, I know, uh, one can, as you were telling us about the hands-on astronomy teaching to the students, this mm -hmm. is what space is doing here in India. And yeah, right. you uh, just told us that the old British method of being in the classroom, taking notes, and don't ask questions. 
so that seems to be a, a kind of a thing which is of the past now because uh, students have access to so much of information through the social media through the through the internet so now they have started asking questions and then uh, it becomes our duty to uh, answer those questions so uh, as far as astronomy and hands on astronomy is concerned how much uh, do you think that it it will have a, a kind of an impact on the kids of today from we had learned astronomy by looking at the books and then looking at the stars so now it's uh, it's the other way around so how uh, what is your take on that well i think it's very important and i think astronomy is in a unique position for this it's a way for students for young people to do science right from the very beginning yeah. even the act of looking at something and learning about it uh, and we all know the book learning is very good but for most students and even for us adults you know the hands-on is much more fun and it's true you're right it's interesting instead of reading the books and then getting the telescopes that's what I did because when there I had no telescopes when I was young <clears throat> but to look at it and then say what is that and be everybody's fascinated and wants to learn it's um, it, it, it's uh, it's the best way. It's the way we learn when we're little. It's how we explore and we say, what is that? And then we start looking more. It's discovering for ourselves rather than being told. And so this is very important, but see the difference is astronomy can do that at any age. And it can lead to anything. If you want to talk about technology, you yeah. can talk about that using astronomy and everything else. So. I really am convinced that uh, that is astronomy education, at even at the earliest ages, it is a fantastic way to get students excited about uh, science and technology and engineering and everything. Uh, coming back to the astronomy and the art combined, and uh, we have seen so much of work being done in uh, astro art and astro poetry. So I think that's uh, you would also agree that that's the point where the science and the art they mingles together and give us something which is which is very unique. Normally people say astronomical thing, but when we talk about uh, art, it, it more relates to the heart rather than to the brain. But yes. for astronomers like us, astronomy is also relates more to our heart rather than to our brain. So Astronomy and art combined together, I think that phenomena is uh, catching up more, isn't it? I, I absolutely, and you know, I think that there's something in astronomy for everybody, but some people see it differently. They are artistic in their being. That's their way of doing it. And they see the beauty of astronomy, or they see the wonder of astronomy. They don't care about the equations and exactly what it is, but they look out and see the unbelievable variety of nature, the patterns, the things that we might try and write equations to understand how it happens. They see the result and they're fascinated by that. I knew about astronomy and art and <clears throat> even in poetry, some of the most famous mm -hmm. poets, but I really never understood that there's sort of a whole other world community of people who are interested in that way. Um, so I think this is very important. And then, you know, in cultures, not just the art, but astronomy is in every culture. It's not true for all their sciences and things, but think, try to think of a culture that doesn't have any tradition about what the stars yeah. are or what the moon is mm -hmm. or something else. It just doesn't happen. It's as much a part of our environment as everything we see every day. Just that in the last hundred years, we've sort of stayed inside with artificial lights and we've lost that, that connection. But it is an, a very important part of who we are. Yeah, so uh, as we can say that, uh, as you have said, all the cultures, for them the astronomy was not as a science but as a, as a way to see the things going around them but then, mm -hmm. when they didn't have anything to, to work on. I mean, in the night they used to see the sky, they used to figure out what exactly a group of stars looks like a thing which they can relate to in their day-to-day -day life and that's how 
uh, these constellations, these zodiac signs uh, come up. And then later on, by using the, the motions of the sun, the motions of the moon and the stars, they came to know about the things which we say science these days is that the time, how the time is measured and direction and especially the geography and things like that. So it's mm -hmm. one way, we have said it's, it's very true that astronomy and art, uh, they're always there. And if I give you some example in, uh, in Indian uh, poetry or, or especially the, the Bollywood movie song, they, more or less they sometimes they, they put the moon in that perspective or because moon for us is a very, I mean, a beautiful right. say that in poetry and in any creative word, the freedom of expression. So sometimes things which they write, they, they don't actually relate exactly to, to that thing. The heart and the mind, when they uh, get both together, uh, they produce something uh, really wonderful. And mm -hmm. Mike, uh, there's another thing I wanted to ask is that uh, when we say promoting astronomy worldwide, what is your experience in, uh, in doing this bit to other countries? If I put uh, US on one side, but your effort in the other countries, like in the African countries, which you are talking about, how how big uh, that uh, I mean effort is to have that kind of a astronomy set up for that particular country? Well, um, what we do mostly is connect the people already interested in astronomy. In many countries, they don't have telescopes at all, but they still do astronomy because they look at the sky and they do outreach because they tell people about it. Astronomy is unusual. If you're a botanist, people know what a tree is, but people don't know what a star is. They don't know what those things in the sky are. They really don't even know usually about what the moon yeah. is. And so they do outreach, but it's, a telescope isn't necessary. So we don't uh, have a chance to, uh, we, we don't have the ability to help people around the world to get telescopes or something like that. We get asked a lot and I can't, we can't do it. You know, we're just a, a poor uh, an NGO, but, um, but we connect those who have it and what we share with them is our resources, our knowledge um, with each other and being part of a community. This is the main thing, no matter where people are, if they think they're the only amateur in the whole country, uh, but they can connect with people around the world and share their fascination with it with them and we have a um, we do have a program a new program that's starting where we are sharing uh, where we are pairing clubs with each with each other uh, North America and uh, and clubs in other countries and we have several involved in India right now uh, we're looking for more US clubs to pair up with and there are many activities there and I, I don't have time to go into all of that so this is really all about sharing, but through that sharing, doing things together, we, you, you learn about new things. It, it, it is support, and everybody learns from this. So um, those were pictures from Observe the Moon Night. Actually, those pictures there were, uh, were from a much before uh, International Observe the Moon Night, the ones with the moon. Uh, well, some they're all different times, but it wasn't International Observe the Moon Night. It's just different ones that were taken uh, by some very good astrophotographers. One of our programs called um, The World at Night, and I say our program because it's under us. It's really run entirely by Bob Tafrishi, who's a well-known astrophotographer. It's about taking landscape astro uh, photographs like that. So, um, yeah, they're from all over, and there are people all over doing it. So let's see, I, well, Cosmic Concert. Well, there are so many things to talk about. Global Astronomy Month is when we do the follow-up to that 100 hours of astronomy. We continue that, but <coughs> expanded it into a whole month. So the whole month, <coughs> the Cosmic Concert is one thing that happens uh, during that month. And it is a uh, Giovanni Renzo, a... Uh, uh, composer and performer in Italy, composes a new piece of music 
and he performs it live in front of time-lapse photographs, uh, videos, and other photographs like you saw behind him. So that's once a year, but it's a very special event because it's special music, and he's, he's really very good uh, going with these astronomical images. And uh, so it's performed live. It's also uh, available to see afterwards, and you, you can find the Cosmic Concert on our uh, YouTube channel, I believe, or someplace I'm sure you can find it to see what it was about. So Global Astronomy Month, we have uh, programs, uh, dozens of different kinds of programs, all the things that I'm showing here. We are gearing up for this. This will be the biggest Global Astronomy Month ever, and it's already the biggest uh, astronomy um, annual uh, celebration of astronomy in the world. So um, so it will be very big, and there are all these different types of programs, and more that I haven't described. Uh, that website will be live very soon. You can see the last one by uh, going to our website and looking under projects. But we'll announce Global Astronomy Month for 250 in the preliminary program very soon. So you can see through a telescope as our special feature. Nope, there's nothing special. But, you know, we consider people to be legally blind here when they can't see well enough to do many things. So suppose you could only see when somebody's standing in front of you, you see light and dark, and you see it move, so you think there's somebody there. But you can't see any better than that. <clears throat> but if you look at stars, maybe the moon, different things that are bright and very high contrast, some of them can still see these objects in the telescope. It's an unusual activity. Most are based on touch, like the planetarium program. There are special books for the sight disabled. And uh, so, uh, but this is one program. It's actually done by somebody I know here, and I think it needs to be expanded to elsewhere because they can't see anything else oftentimes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's a very special thing, but... Uh, I know, it's surprising. Astronomy for the blind. Uh, there's another question from my side. Is that uh, any new programs for the 2015 when we have the International Year of Light? So are we uh, planning to do something in that uh, particular year? Well, I, I actually work on the IAU um, working group for uh, the International Year of Light. And as you know, it was announced very late, so everyone's scrambling to do things. Astronomers Without Borders does not yet have a particular program for the International Year of Light. But there are some we're discussing, and we, we may have some things there. But the most exciting thing is that our platform, it's really, our website will have all the tools. There are many programs that we can do based on the website now with what we're doing right now. So, but from January on, all of 2015, we'll have uh, more happening. Global Astronomy Month will have some new things. We have a total lunar eclipse here in North America. I can uh, very rich in those right now. Uh, and we'll have special lunar programs and educational programs. So there are there are many new things coming up and that will be announced soon. I, and I think, I think mostly we're still working those out for next year. So I would say stay tuned because there's a lot happening for next year. Okay. And uh, there's one more point as an, as an astronomer, as an amateur astronomer. These days we are getting uh, more and more into the, the gadgetry thing and uh, not doing the, the actual observation of the of the sky, I mean, in all those citizen science projects, if you see, I mean, they ask you to either, I mean, do some kind of a cloud computing or through your cell phone you uh, get the light meter intensity and things like that. Amateur astronomer, we are losing that that beauty of watching the night sky on our own, rather than being on a terminal and see something on the monitor, but actually seeing the thing in the in the sky and, and learning things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, <coughs> this is an interesting question. And uh, I think many of the people who are doing things like citizen science are not the ones who are going to end up outside at night on a cold night, all night, staying up. 
uh, I think it's attracting different people in different ways, just like the astro art. The artists are not the ones who are going to be doing that. They, they have a different way of doing it. I think mostly it's just bringing many more people into astronomy. But I do agree, even with the gadgetry, like when you and I were young, CB, a long time ago, uh, we didn't have go-to telescopes. We didn't have all of those things. And uh, uh, we, we learned the sky. And I, I do think that people sometimes, even those who are interested in astronomy, don't get connected well with the sky. The light pollution is a big reason for that but you know many professional astronomers never go out to telescopes and do these things so and some others are really amateur astronomers themselves so um, I think it's a mixed bag you know these other things bring more people in but I really do believe we need to encourage people to go out and see the real sky for themselves as much as possible light pollution is another thing that we don't have time for I know but um, it's, it's broken the link that we have, and most people aren't aware that you can see a dark sky and what you can see. So that's a very big issue. And I, I think that's an important part of the disconnect that's happening too. Light pollution is another big issue, <clears throat> and it's something you're familiar with in India as well, of course. Uh, you know, I've been to India, and I hope to be able to come back very soon. I, I loved it, and there, I have many friends and much work to do there, especially with space. But it's a it's a very important issue because you know if you think about it just a hundred years ago people lived in the dark mostly and uh, the sky night sky was always there and that was the inspiration for all the poetry and all the art and people were connected with it and and now we've lost that for most people so I think that's a very important effort as well and I hope that is ongoing in uh, India as well Astronomers Without Borders is having a hangout, which um, will be in my morning, but it would be uh, later this evening, uh, actually kind of late for those of you in India, but you can always watch it in the archives, and we'll be talking with uh, John luca Masi of the remote uh, uh, virtual telescope <coughs> with an uh, astro artist who did a special graphic book on the Voyager missions that are now leaving the uh, solar system and uh, also with uh, Vivian White of Astronomical Society of the Pacific who came, just came back from India spending two weeks in Dharamsala teaching astronomy to Tibetan monks and some very big surprises there so you know it's but that is at um, 16 UT. So I think uh, the time has come to say I mean, for this particular hangout, uh, bye to everyone. But before that, uh, I should really thank Mike for uh, I mean, taking out your time and talking to us over here. And uh, the other thing is that uh, as we are going towards the international layer of light, and as you have told us that we should be just looking at the astronomers without border and uh, sight and see what's coming up. So uh, I believe and uh, that's been my experience uh, in the space with you and uh, uh, that we have I mean, done a lot together and there's a lot more to be done than together and in the uh, near future to come. And uh, just before closing this thing, uh, I should also uh, Say that uh, during the World Space Week this year, uh, the the theme was space for everyone, and uh, it was primarily for the for the students to learn about the space navigation and all. And they they worked very hard in these events uh, from India and uh, participated on on a very large numbers. And especially these talks, which we have started the space and astronomy talk, this was made specially uh, available for the kids and the masses just to have things uh, so that people should learn more about astronomy uh, rather than astrology in India and uh, mm. we have done uh, uh, yesterday we did a talk uh, hangout today uh, it's a hangout with you tomorrow I think we are doing a hangout with uh, with one uh, aeronautical engineer and then we will be having a talk with the uh, hangout with uh, Patrick Miller uh, 
Professor Patrick right. Miller about the asteroid hunting because he's also there with us for the last five, six years and uh, the work which students are doing in India, it's, it's phenomenal and and let's mm -hmm. hope uh, we continue the, the hangouts and uh, live interactions with you so that students and uh, amateur astronomers here in India get inspired by listening to you and they get something more. So I'm just going to say uh, as I did at the beginning when I introduced myself, I'm going to say it was a pleasure doing this with, uh, with space once again. Um, I'd like everyone to consider joining Astronomers Without Borders, even if uh, the free membership, whatever it happens to be. And uh, I hope to be back in India again soon to see CB and Mila again. And, and uh, I keep planning to go back every year, and I've just never been able to make it happen. So maybe there will be something special in India I just have have to go to.